fascinating true story. Where, at what point did it come about that you wanted to tell this in film form? Well, when I read the script, I didn't, it, I was the last person to come on. You know, Jeremy was already attached to the project as a producer and an actor. So when I read it, <clears throat> I remembered the story, but what really, I was really taken by was just that his, uh, uh, that he was brought down by his own kind. And uh, that, to me, was a, a great tragic irony and, and something that I felt was really worth talking about, um, that injustice. Um, and also his own passion, the Gary, the, the, the character, the real guy, his belief in, in he believed in journalism and getting the truth out in such a deep, personal way, and then to have that sort of turn on you, that own thing, like all of a sudden he's like, maybe my belief was misguided, you know, that idea. Um, I was really sort of taken by. It's also, oops, sorry, it's also really relevant to a lot of things today, and not only political genre, but in mm -hmm. all kinds of businesses. Did you take that into account when you were making it, or was it just something that kind of sat in the back of your The relevant, well, yeah, of course. I mean, I think any story, uh, of, cor of course it's relevant. I mean, t t today, in, as far as, you know, some stories are too true to tell, you know, that idea is extremely relevant as far as, like, national security, we can't say that. Um, but we can give you a little bit of this. That's clearly, you know, relevant. What I loved about Gary's character, and I remember directing the scene with Jeremy, and also I made an adjustment in the script, is when Michael Sheen says, you know, sort of warns him in some stories of the tell, and Gary laughs it off, and he's like, that's bullshit. Like, I don't get that. I, that's, I don't even comprehend that. That, to me, was like, wow. Like, and it takes a guy like that to continue to to dig into a story like that. It really takes that person that's a bit of an outsider. And he was an outsider. He was a David versus Goli David, you know, kind of Goliath thing, even though he doesn't win. Um, I think that's incredibly relevant. I think it, what you just said about it being, you know, uh, in this business or the business of, well, journalism, but the business of Hollywood or the business of any business, I think it's, it's relevant, and the story I think is universal because of that. You know, I think people have no problem getting on Jeremy's shoulders in the movie and relating to his what he does and his obsession. I mean, you're right with him the whole movie. So, were there any challenges when you were uh, creating the film or putting it together? Uh, challenges. I mean, I would say more. Uh, a lot, uh, well, t the typical film logistics is like, okay, we, you know, the studio wants to shoot in Atlanta, and this takes place in San Jose, or I can't go to the, mm -hmm. I can't go to Central America, so they can't afford it, so how do I make this look like Nicaragua? You know, all those filmmaker -y kind of, you know, production issues um, was challenging, but, you know, we, I figured it out. That's my job, very much a movie maker's, filmmaker's job to do. Um... The casting wasn't that much of a challenge, I have to say. Casting around Jeremy, people really, um, people really liked the script, and um, they, you know, and each part was very clear on on how it played into the story. And I think each, you know, Ray Liotta coming in for a couple of days, and Andy Garcia coming for two or three days, or Tim Blake Nelson, they all knew that. Well, they probably knew they weren't going to get cut out of the movie because, like, you can't not have that scene because it's such an important part of this guy's story of piecing the story together. So I, I wouldn't say that wasn't that challenging because people, like, we were able to get the actors. We'd send the script out, and boom, they, um, they, uh, they were into it. Uh, and a challenging part, the, probably the, 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 the trickiest part is because it's a true story, 
and you're balancing. And here's a, a movie about a guy who's claiming I put I connected a lot of these dots and there's truth. And then you're making a movie and you're putting ten pounds of flour in a one pound bag and <laughs> for a movie because what he reported on even goes beyond what I have in the movie. I mean, there's so much. So that one, how to combine certain stories was very tricky, like the Leota scene, because that was a combination of things. Even the Michael Sheen, all those things, all those characters were combination, were, were, were based on two to three people, but we had to put it into, I thought it was more important to put it into one character. And then, and then, just like I said about trying to get so much into a two-hour movie, um, Gary's book, Dark Alliance, the actual book, is like this. Man. It's, the story is so dense, there are so many characters, so, you know, I, you know, a lot of the criticism of the film was something like, would you leave this out? He said, you can't do, you can't put it all in. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was a big part did, of it. Did you or the other filmmakers at any time either deciding to make the movie or while you're making the movie, did you guys have any concerns about your own uh, safety? I mean, because it, it gets pretty deep with the CIA and the drug dealers and naming names. Yeah. You know, I like I, I haven't really thought of it. Uh, no, I, I <laughs> um, a lot of these people are you know not around. Um, we did change some names. Um, you know, uh, Freeway Ricky Ross obviously is in the film. Uh, he's going to be at a screening tomorrow night wow. that I'm doing, and he's going to be in a Q and A with me. Oh wow! Uh, there's a documentary coming out on him that Mark Levin made called uh, "Crack in the System," I think. Freeway, the crack in the system. So that no, I mean, as far as the CIA, it's like I guess they just ignore it. You know, it's so long ago. I mean, they they're a secret. They're not going to start sending people out, it's only going to bring attention to them, so they just ignore it. I mean, I mean, a lot of filmmakers have been down this path. I don't know if any filmmakers have ever been threatened by anyone or anything like that. God forbid that happens, but, you know, I, I never really thought of, uh, was worried about it. Because um, it's been written on, there's been books on it and stuff like that. Yeah. I remember when it happened. Sure. It was like it was yesterday. I yeah. even went to one of the meetings for Maxine Waters. And man, it was a big outrage in South Oh, Sure. Did you go to the town hall meeting that I show at the end with uh, Winita Brooks? I don't know. No, Winita, her. what's her last name? McDonald? No, I didn't go to that one, but I went to the Maxine Waters one. Yeah. And I mean, you couldn't get in the place. There were so many people outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was that town hall meeting is really interesting if you ever want to see it. Uh, but I sort of showed a few clips from it in, in the film at the end. That was like an unprecedented event. I mean, CIA director never went down to questions from <laughs> any community at a town hall um, about, you know, about stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff was about Tuskegee. It was funny. They kept bringing. They, it was a lot of it was that because they were like, "How can we trust you to investigate yourselves again when it took you 20 years, over 20 years, for that to come out?" And then. Uh, John, John Deutsch admitted, okay, those were horrors that happened. Like, he admitted, I mean, he wasn't around then. But uh, I, it was amazing, though, that Gary's reporting did get people asking questions, you know, and get the CIA to do, admit to a lot of what he, he wrote about, you know. Um, so, I mean, look, I, see, the thing is, uh, the, I don't know if you got it, the story wasn't really much reported on in the 80s. A lot of these papers didn't write anything. That's why I believe a lot of, there was a lot of jealousy involved. And a lot of these people missed the stories. Or, or wrote eight-page buried stories where they used a lot of euphemisms or whatever and made it seem like a non-story or whatever. But they felt like, you know, obligated to report it, but didn't go deep enough. Um, so it took an outsider to do that, you know. You mentioned Gary's stories and writing, um, but I'm just curious what other, you know, source material or inspiration that you guys used during this? Whether it be writing it or maybe something for just some um, motivation to get into it? Uh, I mean, the main sources were Gary's book was Kill the Messenger, mm -hmm. Nick Scow. Peter, who wrote the script, was an investigative reporter years back. He's now 
you know, writing, you know, doing script doctoring, and he's directed a movie. He's directing another one, I think now. Um, he checked into some sources. I don't know specifically, like his own work beyond working off of source. You know mm -hmm. what has been written about. You know, I went into a lot of books. I mean, there's 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 no there's no secret that that the CIA. Uh, doesn't have a hand in, uh, in in the drug trade. I mean, it dates back to the Vietnam War and the Afghan Wars, you know. So that's all been written about. It's more of the story of Webb at being turned on the way he was. Obviously, no one knew about that. This one connection through these few dealers, where that coke was sold wholesale to Ricky. And Ricky didn't know where the fucking what where the money was going. I made a point of that. Michael K. Williams hears it in court, and you just see him go. <laughs> it's just one great look from Michael. He did like, holy shit. <laughs> um, so that's the the big new thing that came out. Um, like like the editor says to him, "Guy, this is ten year this is ten year old news." He's like, "No, no, wait a second. This is the point of the story: is that there were victims here, and that it ended up on our streets." The fact that they look the other way, but so I was just going to say, getting back to the idea of the truth, truths that are things that are too true to tell. Uh, I think there are a lot of pressures from some quarters to not say things that are derogatory to the government or mm -hmm. such. Do you have? Well, you know, I think the idea of being called a conspiracy th uh, theorist or conspiracy nut is like, is is that kind of like if you say things that are too too true to tell or something that's could really really upset the apple cart of what you're talking about, right away that person is becomes a conspiracy person, a conspiracy nut, not someone that just actually is onto something. And that's how he was partly discredited too. And Gary, the real Gary, talked about that a lot because he was called a conspiracy nut by all oh, huge, obviously most people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the film gets into that. I mean, you know, the Michael Sheen character to me was his combination of people was that guy that went there and realized he needed his life back, and he we had he rebuilt his life. So he represented what Gary can may become or can be and sort of if he doesn't go as deep he could sort of still have his career because Michael Sheen was that guy that character who who didn't fully go, go there I mean the, the Kerry investigation was in the 80s and uh, that guy we he, he had a few people on that team I don't even get to the names I and mean, you could read it and find who the actual people were but you know they uh, they were stonewalled you know, obviously, it didn't come out of Iran Contra. I don't remember the hearings. I'm sure you remember them. Very little Contra cocaine connection as far as that funding the war. It was obviously Iran Contra. It was over in Beirut and getting all that money. I mean, in Iran, getting that money sent back to, uh, you know, the whole Ali Noor thing to the Contras. Um, uh, but Ali North was involved with this too. Well, how could the coroner? come to the conclusion that this man committed suicide with two bullet holes in the head. That don't make sense. Pow! Oop, I didn't get it. Well, no, what happened Pow. was, what happened was, Gary committed suicide six years, and, and we make that clear in the film, I mean, the dates are there, um, six years after he went through all this, this grinder. Um, and he couldn't really get a job in journalism. His, eventually him and his wife were divorced by 2000. He, he couldn't do what he was meant to do anymore. Plus, his family, he lost them too. I mean, he, they were, and I make a point in the movie, the family was everything to him. It was his rock and, and, his, and his job, his bliss, his belief in the free press and journalism, being an investigative journalism, journalist. Uh, so he committed suicide. He'd suffer from depression, and the two bullets thing is something that I did have to report because people, you know, many many people came out later saying, "Oh, he was murdered." Uh, first one kind of went in and came out. You can see the coroner's report. You can even see a photo of Gary Webb on Google, which you don't really want to look at. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I can't believe people leak pictures like that. It's on the internet. It recently came back on, I think, when the film was announced. It wow. somehow resurfaced, and his wife was really upset by it. The second bullet hit the main artery. And, you know, I look, I'm not a coroner, but I know the, the things I've read is that you were able to, he went like this, and it went off twice. Mm -hmm. That's how it happened. Um, he wrote letters to his family. So I'm not purporting in the movie, it's like there's a big, big conspiracy here, because I could have made that movie. I actually shot something that just, I, I, I look back and I was like, I shouldn't have shot it, and I should have used that time for other scenes, but I did have something of him in a morgue, like five years later lying there and people standing over him. And I ended up cutting it because I felt like it made the movie about a whodunit. It made it all about the conspiracy of how did Gary die, who killed mm -hmm. him, rather than the story that you saw and it became all about that and that's not that's an I think that would be that's not what happened I don't believe that's what happened and I don't think that's a story worth telling that's one of the reasons I think this story stays with you so much is because it's the intimate story of Gary and mm. not the you know the conspiracy well I, I mean it is the conspiracy this. but it's not who killed him right yeah. it's like was he killed by the CIA or by or by drug dealers or whoever um, I it, it it's not that it's the fact that it he was killed by what you saw in the movie that's his death I mean I believe he would I, I probably believe even he did suffer from depression yeah. way even before the big one this big story hit I mean he had issues and it obviously finally caught up with him when when he didn't have that ground to stand on which is his his ego and his job and his 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 family it's like you know it starts you know, years later, he did a lot of drugs and drank too much, and eventually, his motorcycle was taken, which we put into the movie as one of the things. It's like it can't get worse than that. That's like, <laughs> well, it's that's like you know, having his legs, you know, sort of cut out from under him. So, All right, last question, guys. Did you or any of the producers, cast or crew, get a, a chance to meet? with the people actually involved, Gary Webb's family? Yes, or? oh absolutely. Um, well, Nick Scow, who wrote the book, of course worked a lot with Sue, she's all over the book. Uh, Peter, when he first started to adapt it, he spoke to her in 2008, there was a transcript between, just a conversation between them, a 20, 30 page thing. And then when I uh, got involved, her and I spoke, we had two long, very long conversations on the phone about Gary, not about the story, I knew enough about that about their home and the kids and what was it like to be married to this guy and what he was like and that was extremely helpful for me because you know you know then I was able to really it's sort of method directing I guess you can call it is to really inhabit him and understand him and relate to him so um, I spoke with Sue and she's been doing some press and she's a really a great lady and um, I spoke with the son Ian who's depicted in the film as a teenager, he's now 30. Uh, him and I spoke a lot, a few times, you know, and he just kept saying, you know, he just kept, he's funny, he kept saying, it's a, he kept using the word the labyrinth of, of that story that my father went into that rabbit hole and he never came out because the more he, you could continue to read on it and the, anything, any information you can get, it is so complicated and it's so, he could never prove it. You know, and I don't know if it's his job to prove it. His job is to get facts out there and do follow-ups, and he never got to do that either. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so